Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. 16.1 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias. These caregivers provided an estimated 18.4 billion hours of care valued at over $232 billion. 5.7 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. By 2050, this number is projected to rise to nearly 14 million. Every 65 seconds, someone in the United States develops this disease. What does this journey look like through the lens of a believer, and how do you maintain a sense of humor as you navigate the caregiving of someone with this disease? Dave Muir is an award-winning author and talented human writer whose columns and articles are featured in major publications such as Focus on the Family, New Man, In Touch, Marriage, Partnership, and Home Life. He's a graduate of California State University, Chico, and earned a dual degree in political science and information and communication studies. He's the dedicated husband to his wife, Dale, father of two boys, and a caregiver to his mother-in-law who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. He lives in Northern California where he serves as community liaison at Klamath River Renewal Corporation, undertaking the largest dam renewal renewal and river restoration project in United States history. Here to talk about his new book, New Every Day, Navigating Alzheimer's with Grace and Compassion, is Dave Muir. Dave, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Rabbi, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you here and to talk about such an important Mm -hmm. but yet mysterious, Mm -hmm. uh, talked about a great deal, referenced by name in so many circles, but when you face it in your own family and you wind up being a caregiver, and especially a person who is a man of faith, uh, we really need to kind of understand this better as to expectations, understanding, Mm -hmm. where is the Lord in all of this? Mm -hmm. How does this happen? How do we respond to it? Mm -hmm. And how do you maintain a foundation of faith throughout the navigation of taking care of somebody who is truly slipping away? Mm -hmm. So I I wanted to start out this segment with uh, addressing kind of your faith journey and how you saw God early in life preparing you to be the man that you are today and what's been able to equip you to navigate this and being a man who's known for your sense of humor Mm -hmm. how do we maintain that sense of humor as we watch somebody slip away right well thank you uh as far as my faith, I, I was raised in what I call the, the church of the shove in the right direction. Um, and so without identifying the specific uh, religions that people don't put their guard up, just generally the, the, the principles I was raised with was uh, Jesus came, sort of did something helpful, but uh, you need to get on your bike and ride it. And uh, at the end of the day, you have to show that your good stuff outweighed your bad stuff and you've pleased God. And uh, that wasn't super helpful. Uh, and it was uh, when I was in high school, uh, a couple of guys who were uh, believers pulled me aside and started talking to me about God. And I was interested. I was hungry to know, is there some way that you can get right with God? And how do I know when I've crossed that line? And they opened up a Bible, which was a new experience for me, um, because I'd been told, if you tried to read the Bible on your own and understand it on your own, you're just going to mess it up. It's complicated. It's over your head. So I was uh, reluctant to do so, uh, but they just handed me scriptures and started letting me read for myself. Hey, what does this say? Um, he, who is, he who believes is passed out of death into life, and for God so loved the world, and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm just looking down and reading the actual words that seem to make sense, and it took several months for me to, to, to make that leap, but I made this huge leap leap to leave a religion and just take the word of God seriously for what it actually said. And it was very liberating and started me on, on the journey I'm on today, which is I'm going to try to believe God. So <clears throat> I love the fact that you made a clear distinction between religion and faith. 
and mm -hmm. I think there's many people that are confused that uh, being a part of a religious organization is going to bring you salvation or the fact that you are a faithful church attender is going to bring you salvation. Uh, scripture tells us salvation comes through faith alone. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say without religion, right. it's impossible to please God. And, and our Lord told people that, you know, uh, God could raise up uh, followers from these rocks. Uh, it, it's not a matter of, it, they're not all Israel who are of Israel. Uh, it, it's a matter of an individual faith in Christ and the gospel, I, I, I get really um, focused on this because I, I have, was raised in such a fog. The gospel is a very specific subset of teachings in the scripture. It's not uh, uh, love others and, you know, love God and love others. It's not, uh, you know, do unto the others as you would have others do unto you. It's a very specific message that Christ died for our sins. It's this irreducible minimum. It is that Christ, he was Yes, he was a good teacher. That That is not the gospel. Um, the, that he was a comforter, that he was a healer, that is not the gospel. The gospel is a very specific message that Christ, the Son of God, died as a substitute for our sins. And you have to get that. That is the gateway to a relationship with God. And believing foggy things about Jesus does not cut it. There are a lot of religions and a lot of churches that believe foggy things about Jesus, and it's irritating to me because it takes people... I was raised in that. I was raised in that fog, and it was not helpful, and it was not truth, and you need to believe this very specific thing and receive him as Savior. Dave, I'm, I'm not very popular from a perspective that I am a strong proponent that you are living your worst life now. Mm -hmm. and that this concept of you're living your best life now is not the gospel. Uh, here you're faced with a family situation <clears throat> where you are watching someone who you love slip away. And if this is your best life now, if this is the best that's to come, then um, we've actually been sold a bill of goods. Because this is not heaven on earth. It is not. And... and Someday we will be in a place where all is good. This is not that place. And, and I, yeah, I've heard people do that same thing and make promises that God never promised. In fact, Jesus told us, oh, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But no, this is, this is not our best life. This is a hard life. I, and, and, and if we could just talk suffering for just a minute, because that's, I think that's a big deal for everybody. Um, it's a big deal for me. I had a rocky childhood. So things were, I started out in the hole um, and, and a view of, you know, fatherhood was not good. And, and uh, I've struggled with this issue of, you know, does God love us? Every time that scab gets ripped open or every time something hard comes, I think there's a very human default. There certainly is a default for me that wonders, if, he, if God is there and if he really cares, why is this terrible thing happen? If, if he's all powerful, why won't he just fix it? If he can fix it, why won't he fix it? I, I get that argument. It bombards me. Here's where I have to land with that. I have to go back to, instead of something that I don't know, which is why is this happening? And, and people have wrestled with this for a long time, for forever. I'm going to go back to what I do know. Here's what I do know. Christ did not shield himself from suffering. He came into this world. He lived among us and suffered among us and subjected himself to excruciating suffering. He's not dodging our condition and he's not playing games with us. And you don't do that for someone if you're just trying to toy with them or torture them. So here's what I know. God has already proved that he loves us. He prove that in spades at the cross. He doesn't, if he never did anything else for me again, what he did was enough. So I have to go back there mentally and say what he did proves the love of God. The fact that a lot of bad things happen and I really connect it to, hey, the fall happened. Adam and Eve unleashed a lot of bad things and we are the recipient of those bad things. I'm not going to try to parse out, you know, well, what part of this did God, I'm not going to go there because I don't know. I don't know why God makes decisions. Um, I don't know why Peter was released from prison 
and John the Baptist was beheaded. I can't sort that out, so I'm not going to try to second guess what's going on. I'm going to try to second guess God. I'm going to try to focus on we know he loves us, and he, we've also, we also know he's given us marching orders like love one another, be kind, you know, be Christ-like. So let's, let's keep it simple and start, try to st- stay grounded in reality. Uh, Dave, you have a uh, very clear picture of the realities that escape so many who have been mm-hmm. lulled into this for uh, the Jeremiah 29, 11 message, for I know the plans I have for you and their plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And it's a walk out on Sunday with I'm feeling really good uh, about things. But the fact is, is that for the next six days, I'm going to face uh, a mother-in-law that has Alzheimer's. And I may have to introduce myself to her every single morning uh, as she begins to progress through this disease. So I kind of want to talk to you about that. Mm-hmm. Um, you married. Your mother-in-law was, was healthy, happy, uh, involved in the, and being a grandmother to the boys. Uh, did you get along well with your mother-in-law? Sweet lady, registered nurse, um, love to give to missions, uh, adopt, uh, not adopt, but send money to uh, foreign orphans and and really just track with them for, for many, many years. Um, flew to Korea to help out in, a, in an orphanage. Just a sweet, wonderful lady and always good to me, really appreciative of me. Uh, we had a great relationship and it's heartbreaking every day when to see her and have her say now do I know you and you know uh, it, we, we lose something every time we see her you know something is lost and it, and it is a heartbreaker sometimes I'm going to be honest with you sometimes she'll say something that just takes me aback and I think it's a gift of God to be able to laugh when your 86 year old mother-in-law looks at you and says you know I'm left-handed, but I bat with my right. Um, you know, or says, you know, I just got back from Europe last night, and they had breakfast waiting for me. How did they do that? It's like, well, you know how they are. And uh, she will just say things that uh, throw me for a loop, uh, keep me off kilter. Um, she took a fall. She broke her arm. And every day when she would look down, she'd see this cast. It's like, well, where, what is this about? And I said, well, you, you know, you took a fall a couple of weeks ago. You broke your arm. Well, someone should have told me, you people need to do a much better job of communicating. I don't know what is wrong with you. And we just have to keep apologizing for, you know, being inept communicators. So uh, it's it's this uh, interesting mix of being taken off guard, laughing sometimes, uh, still being able to joke sometimes, but then mourning every day what what we're losing. So, Dave, kind of give me the um, progression of this. Uh, <clears throat> When, when did you first begin to notice a change and what was the change that you noticed mm-hmm. that if you were to say to somebody, you have a loved one in your life, here's a couple of things that you can look for that are going to kind of give you an idea. Mm-hmm. And um, what is the prayer response? What is the believer's response? And then for those in our audience that aren't believers, uh, who are looking at this as, as a burden, as a debilitating, uh, caregiving nightmare. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of negativity, mm-hmm. uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, not amber alerts, but elder alerts that go mm-hmm. out where somebody got up in the middle of the night and walked out the door and walked down the street and everybody's on the lookout for a 77-year-old man wearing his pajamas or wearing no clothes at all mm-hmm. uh, walking down the street. So we've, we've heard so much. And the book that you've written, New Every Day, Navigating Alzheimer's with Grace and Compassion, uh, the key words to me are New Every Day because that's God's word, mm-hmm. uh, that behold, I make all things brand new. Mm-hmm. Navigating Alzheimer's because it is unchartered waters there are no two Alzheimer's stories which are identical there are stories which are similar 
but no two stories are identical. And then how do you do it with grace and compassion? So let's, we, you have now a foundation of faith. Your wife, Dale, uh, does she share that same faith with you? She does, and it's an anchor for both of us, um, and we, we pray, um, and we hold on to each other, and we support each other, but um, we, we have the assurance that Karin is going to a great place someday. You know, that, 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 that issue has been decided. Now it's a matter of what do we do every day to make sure she's being taken care of, that she's comfortable, that she's safe. Um, you know, we, uh, let me go back to how we eased into this because we talked about, you know, how do you know what's going on? I didn't. I mean, this was new to me. I, I just, you know, old people, you just go, oh, yeah, maybe they're slipping a little and we were noticing, you know, mail is stacking up at home. Gosh, she used to be on top of that. And uh, my wife, you know, glanced at the checkbook and, and it looked like uh, modern art. This was not a ledger anymore. And you just see signs of, you know, something's going on with mom. And um, we didn't really know what that something was. And again, people, I think, make a, an assumption sometimes at uh, old age. There's a difference between, you know, grasping for a word now and then and thinking that your daughter is your mother. There's a fundamental difference. And and when you start losing the capacity to perform everyday functions of life to keep you safe, um, a, a big alarm went off when she was living independently. We knew she was kind of slipping, but we went over to her house and there was a, an open can of soup in the cupboard and there were vegetables being stored in, in her bedroom not in the refrigerator and so we knew something was off and at that point we said hey why don't you come over and stay at our house for the weekend it'd be fun we wanted to see what was going on two o'clock in the morning i had a police officer in our bedroom shining his flashlight in our face uh saying he was responding to a 911 call and uh nope i didn't call anybody he said well you've got a senior citizen oh okay so we <laughs> grabbed our robes went into the living room and it's like karn you know what's going on um she said well i i woke up and i've never been here before and my husband was gone so i called 911 and i said karn you've you've been here a thousand times and gene passed away a couple years ago and she just looked stunned she said well no one ever told me and that was my abrupt introduction to, okay, I'm not just dealing with a little bit of slippage of a memory. We've got some full-blown thing. We took her to the hospital. We got a doctor's diagnosis. And yes, we're dealing with this debilitating condition. But the way it's, it's not going to come on usually like gangbusters. What, what you're looking for as a family member is, is there something just really off? Um, not just a slippage of a memory, but confusion about, you know, what year this is. Who is the president of the United States? It's not Eisenhower. Um, if there are, if there's that kind of mistake going on or, um, or uh, uh, thinking that, you know, you're living 300 miles away and that type of confusion tells you, it doesn't necessarily have to be Alzheimer's. It doesn't necessarily have to be dementia. It could be a bladder infection. It could be a stroke. There are various things it could be. So don't be the doctor. Get her to the doctor and get a diagnosis. And if you get the diagnosis, then you proceed from there. And uh, proceeding from there is going to, it's not a one size fits all. Um, some family members can and will live with, um, you know, sons, daughters, that type of thing. Some are wanderers. Um, Karen, I found out she doesn't sleep. She doesn't sleep. And we were punchy. I mean, after 48 hours, you know, I was pouring coffee beans in the dog's bowl, you know, and uh, so we, we needed to have a quick family conference and place car in some place where there was 24 seven awake staff. And then we become a big part of her life and we're taking her on outings and we're doing that type of thing. So we're still caregiving, but we, we realized we couldn't take it on completely on our own. Others find that they can. So it's, it really is unique for each, for each family. We're talking with Dave Muir, author of New Every Day, Navigating Alzheimer's with Grace and Compassion. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back from break, we're going to talk about what has loving someone with Alzheimer's taught you that you didn't know. How is it that you're able to navigate? Is being a believer in the gospel 
really that much of a different differentiator in how you're approaching uh, this Alzheimer's disease in your mother-in-law than what you've observed in those who have not. Uh, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with Dave Muir. Shalom, I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that 23andMe kit that you sent off and you got back that report that told you you were Irish, you were French, you were Jewish? Wonder who's interested in that information? It's not like you've sent it off to a database with millions of other people and they can steal your identity and who would really be interested in that information other than you? Well, maybe your friends and family, but there's one, yes, one, who is so interested in your DNA that it would be something that would make you afraid. And that is Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, the biblical line of Aaron the priest. That's because if the priesthood comes back and the high priest takes his role as the head of the Sanhedrin, they will be the ones to call for the return of Jesus. Well, what can they do with your DNA? Well, there are 40 plus countries weaponizing DNA today. And imagine if Satan could weaponize your DNA and use that Y chromosome market to take out the line of the high priest, then Jesus doesn't come back. That is the plot behind the best-selling book, The Codus, now out in second edition, on Kindle, $2.99, also available in paperback. This is a biblical thriller beyond comparison that's going to take you on an incredible journey to understand what they could do with your DNA. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitingandnation.com, and click on Special Offers. There you're going to find the yellow cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey in the Garden of Eden to the seed, the ground, all the way out to the fruit that reveals things of the natural that God is trying to reveal supernatural truths. Contained within these pages are seven laws and seven lessons within each law. They're going to take you on an incredible journey of understanding about the life you live and the fruit you bear. I want to encourage you to click on that yellow cover. We're going to ask for your email. Now, we won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. I want to encourage you to get Seven Laws of Abundant Living Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it at Books A Million. Wherever great Christian books are sold, take this journey with me to the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life we see again at the River of Life. Get your copy today. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dave Muir, author of... Dave, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Rabbi. Dave, before we went to break, I uh, posted the question, what has loving someone with Alzheimer's taught you that you did not know? I can do more than I thought. We can do more than we thought. Um, you can and should readjust your life based on what's happening around uh, those you love. It, when you sign up for marriage, you know, it's for better or for worse. And really that, that goes along with loving anybody. Uh, when something barges into the life of someone you love, you, d you do what you need to do. Um, you don't run away. And it's it's hard. I mean, a, a crisis never knocks on the door and says, hey, is this a convenient time for you? Or you know, I can check in later. Would a month from now work? It doesn't work that way. A crisis barges in and it arrests your attention and you need to respond. And there are there's a fork in the road where you can either become really self-focused and run away or you can walk into the difficulty and really, it's, it's, it's a Christ-like decision. Christ walked into our difficulty. I've got a, a cousin who's, uh, she started to lose her sight when she had two young children. And her spouse said, I, I didn't sign up for a blind wife, and, and he left. And you know what? That was reprehensible. And you don't walk away from people that you love. Um, is it convenient? No. Is it hard? Yes. Is it turning me? Is it stretching me? Um, 
is God more interested in my character than he is in my comfort? Yeah. (laughs) And I have an opportunity here. My wife and I have an opportunity to uh, do the kinds of things Jesus would do, which is you you take care of widows and orphans in their distress. I mean, that's biblical. This is talk about a widow in distress. She can't do anything. She couldn't pay a bill. She couldn't cook. This is a widow in distress, and this is what James calls pure and undefiled religion. Um, walk into it. A, a disturbing thing I've noticed is. People who would go to a hospital if someone was in a car crash or if someone you know had had surgery, open heart surgery, friends would be coming around. They would be visiting. They'd be bringing flowers. With this one, it's like, well, they don't remember me anyway, and so people stop showing up. And it's like they're in need. They're still they're still the person that you knew, even though they may not be able to recognize you, and they may enjoy visiting with strangers. Um, to think that you would visit a person one day and visit them the next and then have no recollection of the day's prior visit. Uh, Some people would say, what difference does it make if I check in on them or interact with them uh, if they're not ever going to remember it? What, What difference does it make if I don't look after them or I don't send the boys over to visit with grandma because they're going to have to every time reintroduce themselves or who are you or aren't you aren't you nice young men your parents must be proud Uh, what is the motivation uh, for those that would kind of blow it off and the same way um, I would describe it as the law of drift Mm -hmm. So you don't go over on one Sunday and you go over a couple of days later and nothing's changed. So the lack of the visit on Sunday was non-impactful by standards of the record. But do you visit with the Alzheimer's patient because it's for their benefit Or is it something that you're doing that God is using for your benefit? I believe it's both. Um, My mother-in-law grew grew up in rural Oregon, and she loves drives in the country. And so she's not she's not mobile.
James wrote that true religion is taking care of widows and orphans. Your mm -hmm. mother-in-law is a widow. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the um, very difficult task of giving love where pure love is actually returned. It's unbridled love, uh, love of a stranger, because each time you walk in the door, you're a stranger. Mm -hmm. uh, does she have any, uh, and, and we see in some early onset dementia patients that they have no short-term memory, but they have incredibly detailed long-term memory uh, going back to six, seven, eight years old, nine years old, and can recount uh, mm -hmm. with great eloquence uh, long, long ago events. Uh, have, have you had that experience with her during this process? Oh, all, all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a, just a really bizarre disease, uh, the way it attacks the brain and, and neurons are falling apart, but, but there are parts of the brain that seem less affected than, than other parts. So um, what we don't do, we, don't, we won't say, hey, remember when you grew up on a farm in Oregon? We won't ask her, we won't put her in the position of trying to remember, but you can get at that shared memory. You can get at a memory in a roundabout way by saying something like, you know what I really like about Oregon? I like the fact that it has farms. And that can trigger something like, well, I grew up on a farm. We had cows. And then she will talk. She, she can talk about her first bicycle. She can talk about the car, the first car that she drove in the 1930s and go on and on with crystal clarity. Uh, some memories might get a little mixed with others, but a lot of detail about old things, whereas she can't remember what happened five minutes ago. So that, yes, that's a really common experience that we have. But it's great because she's engaged, she's using part of her mind, she's having a good memory. Um, so you just go live there with her. And she might, that might create also a, um, a desire like, well, I need to get home now. My mother is going to be wondering where I am. I need to go, I need to go outside and I need to go walk home. And that's when you, um, employ the fine art of a distraction. It's like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Oh, but first, you know, there's some towels over here that I've been need needing to fold. Can you help me for a minute? And distraction is a great thing. So from a logistics perspective, um, the taking away of car keys, the handling of money matters, um, uh, power of attorney, some of the, yes. the, um, um, logistical aspects of processing all this. Mm -hmm. When do you act and how do you act? And does it get to the point where you have to really kind of get them declared uh, non-competent or uh, not incompetent, but non-competent to manage their own affairs? How does all that work? And how did you have to navigate that? And do you talk yeah. about that in the book?
Dave, um, the motivation to share the story and to share your um, journey through this process um, is extremely well chronicled. Uh, do you consider it to be kind of a guidebook for how to navigate? Um, you call it navigating Alzheimer's. Um, who is really the target audience for this? Is it, is it a Christian book? Is it a uh, universal book? Is it geared toward a particular audience uh, when you wrote it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's it's uh, I think the the category that it's sold under at the back is like, you know, aging and, and health or something like that. Um, it is a I would call the audience anyone who's got a loved one with Alzheimer's. If you're dealing with with a family member, a friend, um, a spouse who's dealing with Alzheimer's, I think the book is for that person. I happen to put some of my um viewpoint on my theological viewpoint is in the book it's not overwhelming in the book it's a, it's a it's a subset of the book but i did feel the need to talk about god and suffering because i think that's a universal question and and i do want to share a perspective with uh whether someone is a a believer or not a believer um i think these are questions people are wrestling with about where is god and i wanted to take a stab at not answering, but addressing the issue of bringing the issue up and letting people know where I personally have landed on that. Um, and I do, um, I do put, I do embed uh, the gospel of Christ in that book. Uh, I just want it to be available to people. Um, you know, people are free to choose, not believe, not believe. But I, I just felt it was important to share the a message of hope uh, because. If this is all there is, and, and and suffering is just all meaningless, and we all end up in the grave, and there's and the earth could just continues to spin, and there's no meaning behind it, that is a really depressing story. Uh, and I think the story of Jesus, whether we're dealing with Alzheimer's or some other suffering, I've got a friend who's in a wheelchair, he got crippled at a very young age, and can't walk, you know, just totally changed his life. If this is all there is, it's very sad. And I agree with Paul that if you know. Uh, we're of all men most to be pitied if we only had hope in God in this life and it's not really real afterward. So the book I think is for, for all. And I think it is a gentle way to introduce people who are in a vulnerable position to a story of hope in Jesus. If that's something they're not already familiar with. Do you find that your faith is what sustained you? And more importantly, the fact that you were able to have assurance that your mother-in-law knew the gospel before she went into this phase of Alzheimer's where uh, she may not re be able to recall uh, the decision that she made for Christ. It's very comforting. And what's important, I had someone pose the question of like, well, what if you can't remember God? What if you can't be connected to God anymore because your mind is gone? It's like, okay, we're, we're not saved on the basis of our memory. We're not saved on the basis of can can we sustain some type of uh, coherent relationship with the Creator. We're saved on the basis of the grace of Christ. He's perfectly adequate and perfectly capable of bringing us home no matter what happens to us. Uh, so I have great hope that uh, when one belongs to the family of God, it sticks. Um, uh, our Father does not abandon us, uh, even though we suffer and we all suffer in different ways and we can't figure it out. Um, we do have that anchor that we are loved. We know where we're going. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We're aliens. We're passing through. Um, yeah, I get irritated if someone tries to make this heaven on earth. It's like, nah, not buying that. We're going to a very good place. That comfort and assurance, what is the prognosis for your mother and what is the average um, um, length? Is there any kind of mm -hmm. span in which we can say from the onset of full-blown Alzheimer's, what amount of time do we normally have with them? Yeah, the, the prognosis is always bad. Uh, it is always going to get worse. It is never going to get better. 
ignore any internet story about a secret cure or something magical that you can do, not going to happen. Um, what I've read is that somewhere around 10, a dozen years after diagnosis, uh, people live to be, uh, that's an average on how long people will live. Um, this disease will eventually take you. Um, if it keeps on its progression, you just end up you not, not being able to do any of the functions of everyday life and even forgetting how to swallow and that type of thing. Um, it's a terribly debilitating. Uh, but, you know, an average is just an average. I, and one of the interesting things I've learned, uh, I thought most people with this, this disease, it plays out to the very bitter end when they're in a bed and immobile and incapable of doing anything. I've seen that happen. But I was comforted in in one of the homes that I was in, in a residential home. I, I asked the manager, how many of your clients, your, your residents, have to end up going into, like, a skilled nursing facility or a hospital setting. And he said, virtually none. They typically just pass away in their sleep. And that was, I mean, it's an anecdote, but that's been his experience with many, 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 many residents. They'll get pneumonia or something will just take them or the heart will give out. So it doesn't have to be the most extreme form of the disease that eventually takes them. Um, people can just, you know, pass away from being in their, in their mid eighties. Um, but, if you're on, if you're on, a uh, if you have Alzheimer's, the jet is heading to the same airport. Uh, it's not going to be a smooth landing. Um, it's not going to get better. And any of the medications that are out there are for kind of early on, and they might s somewhat delay, uh, you know, movement or, or address a symptom. But it's it's not going to be a good landing. As you watch. <clears throat> your mother-in-law move towards these drifting moments of recognition mm -hmm. and you're able to watch the decline. <clears throat> how much are you encouraging the boys to interact with her and how much of an impact does that impression have on them? And how are you able to guide them from a faith perspective that a loving God could uh, allow someone who he created to <coughs> suffer or appear to suffer when they're really not suffering. Uh, they're not aware mm -hmm. of their suffering. So one of the wonderful parts about this and dementia is they're not aware of their condition. Right. There, and you've made an important point. There is, it's kind of a hump where, where there's a, a the, the time in the middle is really where they're aware of what they're losing. That can be the most excruciating time. And Karin would tell my wife, you know, I'm just so frustrated. This is so, so disgusting. I can't remember. And she was just very frustrated. And it was really difficult because she was keenly aware something was, she was losing something. And my, all my wife could say is, mom, you're not going to go through this alone. There comes a point when they are not aware anymore of what they've lost. They're not aware of what's going on. And it's actually more peaceful to me. Now, some people are very agitated. It really, And their personality can change. We've been very blessed in that Karin's personality hasn't changed. There are people who will get, you know, who were at one point sweet and kind, who become very belligerent and angry. My heart goes out to those folks. We haven't had to deal with that. Um, my sons still visit their grandmother, and when we can, we'll have her over. It's getting more and more difficult to, you know, she can't remember how to sit down in the car. We'll go to, to her place, and we'll visit her. My boys are really good at that. And the way we deal with the faith issue is I just don't do platitudes. I, I don't feel like I have to have an answer or an explanation, and I get irritated at people who feel like they need to say, well, God did this because, you know, don't don't pin something on God. I mean, I just I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I I believe God is sovereign. I don't know exactly how that works. I believe He's in with us in our suffering. I believe He can bring good out of tragedy. He can use horrible. He Jesus is Exhibit A. Everything that happened to Jesus was illegal, wrong, immoral, horrible, and God used it for great good. We do know that in some mysterious way, there's a connection between. Our suffering, it's, it's, it's working for us, Paul said. It's working for us in a, uh, an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs all the suffering. But I'm not going to get specific about it. I'm just going to say God wants us to love. Um, heaven is coming. Earth is really hard. 
this is a pain machine down here. Uh, so let's not feel like we have to explain it or have a tidy bow put around the suffering. We don't have to pretend it's better than it is. It's awful. Let's treat it as awful. But it doesn't undo the cross and it doesn't undo. Nothing that happens here, a train wreck, a car crash, a disease, nothing undoes the cross of Christ a couple thousand years ago. So I'm just going to go back. I'm a simple person. I'm a simple person. So I go back there because that's my happy place. Have the boys or your wife or even yourself expressed any concern that as you see this play out in front of you, that what if this happens to me? Yeah, you know, it, it creeps into your mind. It's like, you know, hey, is that in our, it, 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 what part of this is genetic? Um, but you know what, you can't, you can't borrow that kind of trouble. I mean, what am I going to do about it? You know, so you think about it uh, and family members, you know, on, on Dale's side. If well, I wonder if this runs in the family. And um, we don't know, so you take it a day at a time. Jesus said each day has enough trouble of its own, so don't just borrow anxiety from the future. Dave Muir, author of New Every Day, Navigating Alzheimer with Grace and Compassion. You've heard straight from Dave's own voice and his testimony that his faith has been his rock and his salvation. It's what's been able to have him get up every day knowing that his mother-in-law is drifting away and there are millions of people dealing with the same situation and the numbers are ever increasing uh, in an aging population. What will you have to draw upon if you were to face this in your own family? Is it time for you to make the decision that it's not going to take Alzheimer's, it's not going to take dementia, it's not going to take cancer, it's not going to take heart disease, it's not going to take a trip to the emergency room, for you to make your peace with God and to make a decision for your life and for the life of those around you to help lead them to a place of peace that regardless of how difficult the trials are, that you have the blessed promise that there is a better life waiting for you and that God sent his only begotten son to take your sin upon himself so that you could have eternal life. A life that's going to look much different for mm -hmm. Dave's mother-in-law in the life to come where she will know no, she'll know no sorrow, she'll have full consciousness of everything that God wants to bring to her remembrance, and she'll have the fullness of joy of being in the presence of the Lord. That's what sustained Dave, that's what sustained Dale, that's what sustained his two boys, and that's what can sustain you. You can find that message and how to navigate Alzheimer's with grace and compassion in this new book, New Every Day, authored by Dave Muir. Dave, thank you so much for sharing your story here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Rabbi. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.